so if you're here today, you're here to uh, hear a little more about surveillance systems, and I'll try to make this topic as uh, exciting, relay my excitement about it to you. I know it's not always the most, um, you know, on the top of the list for ag health and safety in terms of, you know, jazzy topics, but we'll really emphasize and underscore why we really need good surveillance systems and how that impacts our ability to make agriculture a safer occupation. Um, so a little order of the presentation today, I'm hoping to talk about regulations role in surveillance and what how that may impact what is captured or not captured, what currently the federal landscape of injury and illness reporting looks like, where some of those gaps are, and some of the research that we're trying to undertake in order to fill those gaps. And I'll give some examples from our work here at the Northeast Center that cover both hospital records and pre-hospital care reports in how we try to fill those existing gaps. So starting off with the real question of like, why are we even bothering to do this? But I think it's probably known to everybody that's um, watching this webinar that without the quality data to support decisions in terms of public health funding and programmatic changes and intervention design, et cetera, those, um, the burden of disease and injury in agriculture will continue to slip behind other industries and they already have in some ways. So I think, you know, the icons there are really to represent fatal um, fatalities, occupational morbidity, disability that would come from those. So just kind of that overarches and, and overscores our entire reason of why we conduct surveillance. So what is surveillance? I think, you know, so much of the time we think about NSA and, you know, spies and, you know, hunting down information, but we do that in a different way. And we're collecting and analyzing and interpreting those health related data. And exactly to do that, to support the public health planning, to evaluate how our um, efforts are going, and also to determine are there changes over time. Hopefully we have a positive impact in that regard. So we'll take a step into a little brief history of, of agricultural regulation and impact on occupational morbidity tracking. So the agrarian myth, I think some of us have heard about this, but if you haven't, it's sort of this notion that farming has always been seen as this idyllic profession, very virtuous, and something that sort of has supported the foundation of our country really since the beginning, and that farmers are really seen as the bedrock of democracy. And I think if you ask non-farming people what they think about farms, I think they have this picture in their mind of, you know, the cute cows and the beautiful fields and the farmhouse and the barns. And maybe we don't think so much about the hazardous workplace that exists. So taking that into mind, that agrarian myth really underscored a lot of the decision making that went into some of the agricultural exemptions that were put in place back when OSHA was formed and when some of these policies were initially made. So at a time, it was seemed to be politically advantageous to exempt farmers from burdens and regulation and none of us can blame farmers for not liking regulation. I don't think any of us really <laughs> enjoy it. But um, at that time, they were exempted. I think it was somewhat of a political move. And interestingly enough, in the years after that, some of the legislators that initially voted or, or supported that cause, you know, had some pause later on to say, maybe that wasn't exactly how we should have done it, or to think about it in a different way. But what this really caused is a lasting policy of non-regulation for farming. Not entirely. I think many of you know that there are plenty of regulations that farmers have to deal with. But in terms of, of OSHA, which I'll get into a little bit later, and how injury and illness data is collected, that's really sort of what I'm focusing on here. And I'm not here to comment whether it's good or bad, but just what the impact has had on our ability to conduct surveillance. And some of these citations are coming from paper by Kelsey that was in the American Journal of Public Health um, quite a few years ago, but I think the overall story still holds up quite well today. So thinking about agricultural exemptions for OSHA in particular, so a farming operation is exempt from OSHA activities if it employs 10 or fewer employees throughout the now or the last 12 months and it hasn't had an active temporary labor camp in between now and the preceding 12 months. And the reason I bring this up is that uh, this affects a lot of farms. And for us, we're sitting here in the Northeast. Um, we're based in rural New York and central New York. Our center serves um, the Northeast region and many of our farms are exempt from, from OSHA reporting. And that would mean they don't have OSHA inspections like men, many places in general industry or other places would, and that they don't track injury and illnesses in the same way that larger operations or other industries would track injuries or illnesses. 
So some of you may have heard of SOI or the Survey of Occupational Injuries or Illnesses, but that's sort of a, a frequently used federal um, survey that tells us a lot about what's happening in industries across the nation and in states across the nation about workplace injury, illness, it can include things like days away from work or if somebody had a job transfer to a different types of duty, for example. And because it's a survey, there's a, a pretty um, described and detailed sampling frame and sampling structure. But based on our previous slide, farms that are small farms would not be sampled in that process. And therefore, for agricultural numbers, it's the large farms that would be included in the soy sampling frame. And therefore, depending on the region of the country, the soy data may be better or worse in terms of quality for ag surveillance. So again, for us in the Northeast with, you know, we would lose out on some of that data for the smaller farms. That certainly would be the case for some of the smaller farms in the, the Southeastern uh, area and really across the country. So while the data reported for farms, you know, can certainly be valuable for the target that they're sampling, we do miss quite a bit. So how do we go about filling in these gaps? And I think researchers, across the nation and across around the world, we've certainly looked to our international partners, have really employed a variety of methods in order to do this. And I just wanna highlight a few examples today, and this certainly is not an exhaustive list, so <laughs> don't, uh, don't take this to be, this is the be all end all. Um, but for national coverage, thinking about fatalities, we have the survey or the census rather of fatal occupational injury, which does a quite a good job for agriculture, although there are notable ex uh, exceptions from that rule. And there's been a paper recently published out of the Marshfield Center that covers some of those exemptions in terms of um, agricultural events. Soy I described previously and noting that it does have limitations for small farms. Some of the national coverage work um, also out of the Marshfield Center, but Ag Injury News, a news clipping service that is looking to capture fatalities and noteworthy, newsworthy uh, incidents that are in the newspaper that has expanded to the nationally and actually internationally now. I think they have some coverage from Canada and elsewhere. And then I also want to recognize the work that NIOSH has been doing in terms of being able to allow folks to data mine themselves and something like the worker health charts is quite valuable in that. Now, in terms of regional coverage, the behavioral risk factors um, surveillance uh, survey, there is an industry and occupation module that's used in certain states, and that theoretically can be used to filter down to ag forestry or fishing or just agriculture in places that there's large enough numbers. And then some other efforts from our colleagues around the country. Um, and again, not an exhaustive list, but Dr. Rautianen at the Central State Center has um, been conducting surveys with farmers and ranchers for quite a few years now and estimating injury and illness rates. Uh, the Great Plains Center has uh, surveillance workers' compensation records. And again, I think looking at the, mid, the Midwest and there are many larger farms, I think that's a great way to be capturing those data. Minnesota is working on some disease uh, surveillance for zoonotic diseases on farms. And Eva Ship at the Southwest Center um, has been looking at motor vehicle crash data and how we can use that. And we here at the Northeast Center um, are focused on data mining and existing data sources. And now, as I've mentioned before, these are some examples. I focused on agriculture. Our colleagues often are mixing in uh, logging and forestry injury surveillance, as well as commercial fishing injury surveillance. And there's a lot of effort in those areas through NIOSH and others, but I won't touch on that too much in this presentation. So this likely se seems familiar to some of you. I think you know you guys are represented down below, but just highlighting the states that are involved in our center's region. So West Virginia up to Maine. And as I mentioned earlier, we're based here in uh, Cooperstown, New York and upstate, uh, upstate New York. So I'll talk us through some of the experiences that we've had here using those existing data sources and um, potentially how they could be employed elsewhere or maybe tailored to different industries. But before moving on, I want to think about surveillance. I've been I'll be talking about research here and the research methodology that we're using to create the surveillance system. But surveillance, public health surveillance, is really a tool in an epidemiologist's toolbox or a health department's toolbox to track those trends. So we have kind of two sides of the coin where at one point we are researching how can we make the system more robust, less cost, you know, work more efficiently. And on the flip side of that is 
using these data actually for the public health programming. Um, so just keeping that in mind. So what, what was our goal here? What is our goal here? So we are, have sought to create a surveillance system for traumatic injuries in agriculture, forestry, and commercial fishing. And given our geographic nature, we do cover all three industries, which I think you guys in the Southeast uh, certainly do. Plenty of coastline and, and plenty of trees down in that region as well. And we had some goals for this system. Many systems in the past have gone by the wayside because they're too expensive. It's too timely, too much work to kind of collect and aggregate all of those data. So reducing the expense, making the data more timely in terms of reporting data faster so there's not so much of a lag time between is important. Easier to operationalize means that we can make the whole thing function a little more smoothly. Easier to disseminate data, how can we then give it back to the folks that need to use it for program planning. And we need to have a consistent way to capture those data over time in terms that we can then track if injuries are increasing or decreasing that injury rate. And eventually our goal is that we span largely the, the entirety of our region. And we're doing that sort of in a piece by piece um, section as we have new data use agreements with new states. So our injury definition, sort of what are we looking for? And, and I will focus on injury for the remainder injury and acute events for the remainder of this presentation and not touch on illness too much was it which is a whole another um, layer of complication in terms of finding injuries but. so you'll notice that i have aff written here and that's again reflecting the fact that we are looking for agriculture forestry and fishing so we're looking for injuries that um, occur from a source an ag forestry fishing source happen in an agriculture forestry fishing location or while doing that type of activity. So an example of the activity that may not meet the other criteria could be a roadway crash that involves a tractor or combine that's transporting, but it's not in a farm field, for example. We are searching for things that are severe enough to require emergency medical attention. And so those things would include things you know, we're talking about physics here now. So exposure to energy, that transfer of energy, but also absence of essentials like heat or oxygen. So um, heat stress or hypothermia, those sort of things, or if someone succumbs to an oxygen deficient environment, that would also be included. And those you can see listed down below. I won't read through all of those, but the one thing I'll mention too is the uniqueness of farming is that sometimes you live on the farm and we are not including um, injury events in our system that occurs on a farm site, for example, but doesn't involve a farming activity or um, source. So if little Johnny is riding his skateboard in the farm driveway and busts open his kneecap, that's not an agricultural injury just because it happens on a farm. Um, and the other piece here, which probably seems like it's intuitive, but we've come across this in all of our records, is that we do exclude events where no injury is documented. So we do come across times where there is a ambulance report or some sort of record of an agricultural event happening. Um, that could be a barn fire. It could be an almost injury or a tractor rollover, for example, where the occupant is actually not injured, but the ambulance showed up because someone called 911. And if the person doesn't have an actual injury sustained, it's not then considered part of our system. So inherent to our system is that it's very task-based, and you'll see what I mean about that a little bit later on in the presentation. But we have to have different ways to classify things. It's not so black or white or cut and dry in terms of, yes, this is absolutely an agricultural occupational injury, or no, it's absolutely not. So we have this case determination um, scheme that we use that allows for that variation. So we can suspect that something happens in agriculture, and that would be by what is written in the narratives that we find. And again, you'll see those later. But, and we know for certain it's an acute or traumatic event that a fracture occurred or something necessitated um, medical attention. So that is one option. The other option is we're certain that it's a, an agricultural event or it happened on a farm and it's work related. But sometimes we don't have enough detail from the record to say that it's absolutely 
a traumatic or an acute injury, for example. So there, these options allow for that sort of shades of gray in between and allow us to either aggregate cases together if we need to or split them apart. So the first um, options that I'll talk about here is our ability to use or leverage hospital data in terms of identifying ag, forestry, or fishing, and in this case, primarily agriculture, um, injuries in hospital data. So instead of looking for a workers' compensation payer, for example, or only looking for things that may have a work-related checkbox or something, because that doesn't often translate in the hospital records, some hospitals and, and states maintain those variables, but they're not frequently filled out. So we decided to go a different route. And for injuries, we're using the ICD-10 codes. So those are the hospital codes and E codes or the external cause of injury codes. So we have combed through the 6,810 options that currently exist in the ICD-10 E code scheme for things that could be related to agriculture, forestry, or fishing. And we've created this crosswalk or this mapping scheme that can say if this ICD-10 E code shows up, it is an agricultural case and it would mean this in the occupational injury and illness classification scheme. So you can have a one-to-one -one crosswalk and we've gone through and done that. In addition, we were able to use our hospitalization data to see about when more than one e-code is present, that combinations of e-codes could actually provide more meaning and may change what the OICS codes are mapped to. So we also have those combinations of codes mapped. And what this does is it allows us then, as we get newer hospitalization data or hospitalization data from a different state, we can start using this mapping system to run through the data rather quickly. And then what's left is only classifying maybe new combinations of E codes that show up. And then we can assign OICS codes to that. And again, if that combination shows up in future data, it's already, already done. Now let's look at an example of what a true agricultural injury from hospitalization data may look like. So from this particular person's hospital record, he had a code that for ICD-10 E code of VH40XXA. So that gibberish <laughs> translates into the driver of a special agricultural vehicle injured in, a, a tra in traffic. And it was the initial injury and he was the, um, it was the initial encounter. So we can take that those, that E code can then map to a source of injury in a type of event in OICS which is a system that many occupational health researchers use to classify their, their injuries. So our colleagues use that system frequently in the ag world, but it's also used by occupational health um, and injury epidemiologists in other areas. So we can map those to an off-road vehicle and to a, a type of event of a roadway incident involving motorized land vehicles. But more importantly as well, I want to point out that we have information from the hospital data that gives us I think, you know, very telling thing. So this was a male, he was age 50. He had a two day inpatient stay. He actually had a workers' compensation claim, which at least for our data is somewhat unusual because often again, some of them, they're smaller farms. They may not actually have to carry workers' compensation um, insurance if they're a sole operator, for example. And in just the two days, he had a $25,000 hospital bill. So I think just thinking a little bit about the burden of agricultural injury for a two-day stay for, you know, a roadway incident involving a tractor, we're assuming, or an agricultural vehicle, um, it's, it's astounding. And this is only the hospital charges. This doesn't even account for anything, say, if he had to have physical therapy or any kind of follow-up uh, medical expenses. So not only are we tracking injuries, and sort of ticking the, you know, this is the number of things that have happened and this is how it happened. But we're also getting a sense from these surveillance systems, and this is not unique to ours and also in some others, but what is the burden of, of occupational injury in agriculture in terms of costs and who's paying those costs, et cetera. So we conducted a hospital e-code mapping scheme through some data that we had for a few of our Northeast states. Uh, so Massachusetts, Vermont, and New York. And we're able then to identify, and we can then get into those records more, more detailed in terms of who paid, how much, et cetera. Um, 
based on if it's a true agricultural record, we can actually also then see if it was just an emergency department visit or if it required an inpatient overnight visit or multiple days, or if it was an outpatient visit. And then again, we have the classifications for if they were suspected. Sometimes the suspected agricultural cases would involve or animal related, but you can't tell for certain that it's on a farm. You can, of course, exclude things like dog bites and, you know, interaction with deer, etc. But um, these would be sort of larger, you know, livestock type animals, but horses in particular, hard to tell if it's a recreational um, injury or a farm injury. We get down to see that, you know, for there's not insignificant numbers, and these are very difficult to find through other means of occupational injury surveillance. For those of you that are interested in kind of learning more about this crosswalk, um, you can certainly contact us directly, but there is a paper in injury epidemiology that's open access um, for anyone that would like to see, and I'd be happy to share that later on. I think now I'll transition a little bit into the other piece. We talked just before about just hospital data, but the other part, sort of the other bread and butter of our system relates around pre-hospital care reports, PCRs, you'll see them called. You can also think of them just as ambulance runs. So anytime an ambulance goes out, there's obviously paperwork involved and we are using those to try to identify agricultural injury. So we've been doing this in terms of ambulance report research for over a decade now, we started, as, the, as number one said, by reviewing carbon copy um, papers. This was before the electronic transition happened. And we went through over a quarter million um, carbon copies of handwritten PCR reports from these EMTs in their chicken scratch and scroll uh, to identify ag injury. And we were doing this in a 10 county region within New York State. So we learned a lot from that process. Throughout the time toward the end of that grant, the um, National EMFs Information System got up and running. They were transitioning from paper reporting to electronic reporting. So for us, that opens up a whole new plethora of research opportunities. So they also, in most of our Northeast states, and I think around many states, have a location code. And in the Northeast, we have a farm location. So we were able to then subset that electronic data set by the farm location code, which was great. I think that's one piece of the puzzle. So we did some analyses understanding how often is that farm location code marked off, and it's actually a farm case, but also how often is that location code not marked off or it's mismarked in terms of farm location came right next to, I think the option for nursing home in the drop down menu. So there was sometimes some misclicking. And how often was that happening where the narrative, the, the description that the EMT wrote mentioned a farm injury, but we wouldn't have found it if we just looked at the location. So there's a lot of these nuances that we get into. So we started searching through the free text or the narratives just by using farm keywords. And we're at the point now where we're starting to utilize some machine learning techniques to make that system more efficient. So I will profess before I move on that I am not a machine learning expert. We have wonderful colleagues and partners that um, all work together to make this system work, but I will do my best to go through this. So for our machine learning process, we're essentially taking tagged data, which we have tagged ourselves, and we use that so it has a determination assigned to it. We use that to train the computer, essentially, or to train that algorithm, and build that model. And then whatever the model outputs, we lay human eyes on it and we say yes or no, essentially. That's, that's what it should be finding or no, that's not what it should be finding. And then this becomes an iterative process. So essentially, we're using these known patterns to predict what we may see in the future. So an example here would be the probability of the farm location being true and it containing an agricultural keyword and it being a case, for example. So here the blue highlights would, rec would rec recognize um, two cases of the farm location where it's a true agricultural injury case. Here would be an example of the farm location 
with a keyword, but it's not a true agricultural injury case. And we've seen this happen many times. So here for true cases for agricultural injuries that we're looking at, the probability of finding it by the farm location would be two thirds essentially. So thinking about the probability of a records classification and given what we know about those components, we're using a naive Bayes in that machine learning um, uh, process to then try to classify additional cases. And really for naive Bayes, each variable is considered independent of the others, although that may not be true in reality. But oftentimes we're using the likelihood of a variable or a keyword, for example, being in a given record and the probability of that record being what we're looking for. So we are able to do this by having a large data set where we've already done that. We, we know exactly what's contained in that tag data set in a given record. And then we know whether or not that record is what we're looking for or not what we're looking for. And then this is just repeated many, many times through Naive Bayes and it kind of reinforms itself as it goes on. So in order to create that tagged data set that I've been referring to, we visually inspected 50,000 ambulance report records and tagged them as to their status that I showed before, whether it was a true agricultural case, whether it was a suspected uh, agricultural industry with a traumatic injury, or whether or not it was a agricultural industry case and we suspected it to be a traumatic or acute event. Then lastly, there was plenty in the majority of cases that were tagged as what we would call a zero or a non-hit or it's not related at all and we don't want the um, machine learning algorithm to identify this later on. So you can imagine <laughs> to go through 50,000 records uh, very carefully and to ass assign those determinations took quite a while. So that's not a sustainable surveillance system. We would have to employ people to do that all the time and it would be very expensive and just very burdensome. So we've done this for this, well, it's not quite small, but we've done this for that 50,000 records. And then we use that information to then get the computer working on the other part. So to kind of review with you what variables we're able to use for that um, data set, we have information, as I mentioned previously, about the incident location. The mechanism of injury is retained in these. The dispatch reason would be when 911 is called, what the 911 um, dispatcher actually types in to send out the ambulance or the fire department, for example. The primary impression. The stemmed keywords you'll see in the next slide, and those are the options of keywords that we're looking for that we feel identify best agricultural injury in our states that we're looking for. So that could be very different for adapting the system to a different area of the country, for example, um, depending on what we're growing or raising. Um, so we can talk about that a little bit later. We have gender, admission date, date of birth, zip code, and state. And those variables we've used in the past to then match between the hospital data. So we have undertaken that process as well to understand how frequently is an ambulance report record um, case identified in the hospital case. So we're not counting things doubly, but it's also fascinating to see how infrequently we can actually match those two things together. Not in so far as matching the finding the person in both places, but that either once you get to the hospital, there's not much mention of the agricultural injury and just you can tell somebody's injured but not know why. The converse also happens where there's not a lot of data in the in the ambulance report, but typically there is. So that's what we're looking at. So this is just a, a smattering of the stemmed keywords that we had developed initially for our system. And when I say stemmed keywords, you'll notice that some of the keywords you can read the full thing like farmer and then some are sort of chopped off like if we look at fence for example f-e-n-c with the e chopped off now the stemming part is part of the machine learning process and that is because you can imagine with the english language that there can be different endings on many words but they would have the same an initial meaning at least to us that we would want to find um, the word fence, F-E-N-C-E, we would also want to find something ag-related if it was fencing, 
say they were installing new fencing and injured themselves. Um, so that's why it looks a little funky in some of them with the, with the endings chopped off. Now, I have to ask, does anybody have any thoughts about what these things have in common? <laughs> I realize I can't see the chat box at the moment, but if anybody does, um, maybe Philip, you can tell me. And if nobody has any thoughts after a few seconds, I'll move on and give you the, give you the answer, but I'll, uh, I'll see. Sure, yeah, if anyone has any, um wants to put a comment in, you can write it in the chat bar and I'll uh, relay that. Nothing so far. All right. Um, okay. I'm, th I'm looking at it and- um, <laughs> You didn't know there's gonna be a quiz in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so um, there are a couple oh, I do comments. See the, I do see the chat, okay. yeah, there we go. Yeah. All right, non-agricultural keyword words used elsewhere. They can be confused words, exactly. Yep, so Sarap and Christina, you guys are right on. Barn and dress barn. Perfect. So we ran into this scenario, uh, and thank you guys for participating. <laughs> um, we ran, ran into this scenario where we are frequently coming across keywords that are agricultural in terms, but have no agricultural meaning because of the combination of words that they show up in. So as Seraph mentioned, barn and dress barn, farm or farms in Cumberland Farms, which for those of you who are unaware, that's a very popular um, gas station and convenience store chain in the Northeast. Um, you'll notice <laughs> one of the first monster trucks I saw as a child, grave digger. Um, digger is something that we are looking for, but not grave digger. Um, this is a pit bull puppy. So whenever we see incidents, you know, initially we're seeing incidents of bull being pulled, we would get dog bites, Charlie horse, um, you may want to find a stall in a stable or a barn, but not a bathroom stall. You get the idea. So we've had to deal with um, these common uh, combinations of words. And what we've done is we've imported those into, um, we've imported those into our machine learning algorithm and said, we want you to find these options of farm, for example, and then it says not Cumberland Farms or that option. So we have adapted our system as we've learned about some of these new combinations to exclude the cases we know we don't want to find. And I know there was some mention about looking through other data sets about pit bulls, you know, when you're looking for bull related incidents. Um, and I think the farm tractor or roadway uh, comment that was brought up is another good one that we have excluded tractor trailer because of roadway incidents, but not other types of farm tractors. I won't get too much into talking about misspellings of some of these common keywords that we want to use. That's for a whole nother <laughs> presentation, but um, we do have to account for these common words, especially in terms of locations. So I'm sure this is the case where you guys live, but we love to throw in agricultural terms in road names in, you know, places. So this, this here is, you know, Chicken Farm Hill Road is less than a mile from my house. And we would not want to find all injuries that happened on Chicken Farm Hill Road unless they were truly agricultural. So um, thank you for entertaining my, my questions there. So I want to walk through an example of how to understand this machine learning process. And this, this is in my own mind because I'm not a computer scientist and hopefully I can relay a little bit of how this works to you guys. All right. So we'll talk about an example here that we'll use for um, a skid steer. This is a, a made up example, but very reminiscent of other injuries that we've found. Um, so you'll see somebody here, they're defacing um, silage in a um, bunker silo there, getting that down with a skid steer and a defacing attachment. So keep that in your mind as we walk through this exercise. So here would be the narrative that would you know, be found in the EMT's report. So the worker was found trapped under the defacer attached to the skid steer. He was defacing the silage at the time of the incident. So when we look here, so we have the word defacer, which is one of our keywords. We have the word skid steer, another keyword. We have defacing, ing, and we have silage, 
Okay, so we're focusing on those particular keywords there. So when we look at those keywords in particular, as I spoke briefly about before, Sometimes in the stemmed keywords, you would notice that they would be chopped off or we're looking for the same root of the word. So for defacer as the uh, the noun and defacing as the action being taken, D-E-F-A-C is common to both of them. So we're going to chop those off. We've just stemmed those keywords essentially. So now we're really looking for just three there's three options that we're seeing in that narrative then if we're looking for deface, skids tear, and sci with no E at the end, um, because that again could have different endings. So now let's return back to that narrative. So this narrative you'll now notice is uh, chopped off. So this is a stemmed narrative where it doesn't include all of the words, but it's kind of breaking it down. So the machine learning algorithm will do this for all the narratives in our database. It'll cut off, the, it'll stem all the words, it removes punctuation throughout. And then we can go through and we're looking for the stemmed keywords. So deface is the same now, skid steer without the R, and then silage. So we've got those there. So that's kind of a bit about how the stemming works and we're sort of cleaning up that text in advance of, the, of Python kind of running through with the machine learning algorithm. So, I was having a hard time thinking about how to display sort of how we narrow down this needle in a haystack problem. So hopefully we can walk through this together. So each heart on the screen represents 1000 ambulance reports, just for a little context, it may be kind of hard to, <laughs> to imagine. So with all the hearts on the screen, you are looking at 2.7 million ambulance reports. So let's start off now. So initially in the system, we remove any duplicate records and we remove any records we know to be sure that we are not interested in. Those could be ambulance records that refer to a neonate, a transfer from a nursing home to another facility, just things that we know for sure will not have an agricultural injury in them. So by doing that, we're able to sort of chop off that yellow strip that you see on the screen there. So now we've shrunk down the pool of ambulance records that we're looking through. So next, we apply those keywords that we saw previously, those stemmed keywords, to the what was before the black box of, of hearts there. So by looking through for specific keywords, we actually get the section now that are green hearts. So you can see again, we've shrunk down the the um, whole number of records that we're looking for. So this was sort of our, the previous iteration of our surveillance system was a keyword. We were looking through every single one. So by employing the machine learning methods and using that tagged data that we've had, we're able then to identify an even smaller subset of records. So those are represented in blue now. So the blue records are the ones that the machine learning algorithm essentially will spit out and that we then need to do visual inspection on. So you can see it's about one fourth roughly of what we had to do before without the machine learning algorithm. Lastly, once we've done visual inspection, the red heart represents the number of agriculture and forestry injuries we've actually found out of 2.7 million ambulance records. So hopefully this kind of walked through a little bit about how we sort of narrow that circle down and make it easier to find that needle in the haystack. We're essentially making the haystack smaller so it's, we're faster in finding that needle. So what we just ran through in that heart exercise um, is displayed here on the screen. So we had over 2.7 million records and again removing duplicates and whittling that down. So you can see each step of the way the actual numbers associated with what we've reduced. So down to 95,000 records that had keywords, we're running our machine learning algorithm through that. And we set a threshold by having reviewed, reviewed them that records that meet this 90% true positive threshold are then imported for visual inspection. Um, so it's, it's quite the process, but um, it, it's at least helped us uh, get the cases that we want and need to identify without spending enormous amount of time doing that. So in looking at the receiver operator characteristic curve here for our data, 
the left is a little graphic sort of cartoon to look at ROC curves. So essentially, let's go through this one. If you're at 50%, this red dotted line, or in our case here on the actual data, the blue dotted line, that would be a completely random classifier. It would be a flip of a coin whether or not the algorithm is finding what we needed to. The closer that you get then to the upper left hand corner, the better the classifier works. So, you know, a perfect classifier would be at one every single time it does it properly. And you can see here that ours, our ROC curve, the area under that curve is 0.95. <clears throat> so 0.95 is pretty darn close to one, which is a good thing for us. And this, this looks like very old data, but the free text narratives sort of remain pretty, pretty stable over time. This was data that was trained from two separate years of a co combination of data from Maine and New Hampshire, and then, or sorry, tested on two separate years, but we had trained it on the middle year. So that was working quite well. If we look here again, another example. So I'm showing you the, on the left-hand side of your screen, the ROC curve that you saw on the previous slide that was trained on two years of data from both states and, um, and then tested. On the right side of the screen, we're assessing whether or not we can train and test data, or sorry, test data on one state and train on another. And that's important because if we're trying to expand the surveillance system uh, geographically throughout our region, we want to know if we create a uh, tagged data set for, um, let's say, New York, for example, where we are. And how well would that work if we are trying to identify injuries in Pennsylvania next? So this starts to give us some information about that. So you'll notice that the ROC curve is not as great. However, it's still 0.86. So we're still definitely better than just random classification. And our goals over time and working with our, our whole team is to make you know, we're working to make the uh, ROC curves look a little more like this, get higher up into this corner, which would mean we're finding the cases that we want to find and minimizing the number of junk cases that are mixed in, um, for lack of a more eloquent way to say that. Um, so that's what those represent. And, you know, we've been using Naive Bayes now, but we are also exploring other machine learning algorithms and seeing if any others work better and looking to employ some new methods and how we do that as well. So as before, there, there is a paper out on this um, in Health Information System Science and Systems that sort of explains the nitty gritty of how this was done. And I'm happy to share that with anybody that would be interested as well. So Sarap, you're asking, what would be the, low, the reason for the lower um, ROC in Maine? Let's, let me go back one slide. So it's not necessarily lower in Maine, but what would happen is it's lower in one state to another versus when we test on different years from a single state. Because you can imagine that in a given area with the same EMTs and similar types of injuries happening, that the reports remain rather consistent in how they're written every year, and that doesn't change dramatically year to year. What does happen when you move into a new state or new region is that potentially there could be new um, keyword combinations that we didn't anticipate before. Similar to the slide that I showed you about like Dress Barn, for example, there could be new um, businesses in one state that have an ag name that is we didn't know about until we look through the data that may push that down. Um, there could be different types of industries, ag industries in those states that maybe we'd have to account for and adapt the keywords to, to utilize. So I think that's why in terms of moving from one place to another, it's not as perfect, for <laughs> example, as it is when you're expanding additional years in the same state. So we do some homework essentially when we move to a different state about, okay, are there other keywords that we should be considering adding? Or can we run through the data before we even get too far ahead of ourselves with our current keywords and look for any of those proper names that include agricultural references that we want to automatically exclude? So hopefully that answers your question. 
And again, as I mentioned, some of those details in terms of why, <laughs> how they are there um, are in this, in this paper as well. So as we're wrapping up here, I just want to touch very briefly on what do we do after we have data from hospital data, we get data from the ambulance reports, we want them to be able to talk to one another. And, and again, I mentioned that many of our colleagues are using the system also, so our data then can talk to each other as well. And we're coding those so we can then do some of those trend analyses uh, through OICS, which was developed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics as well, and NIOSH worked on this as well. So you'll see here it's a hierarchical um, system where at the very top level it's a very broad category and then it filters down into getting more and more specific where we can then say okay it was a combine for example and if you don't have this level of detail you can then roll up to the higher levels so i just want to show you two examples one from agriculture one from forestry of the types of injury reports that we do get out of the ambulance records so here is a redacted um, uh, case that we have, which was a true agricultural case. And I'll direct sort of the information down below as the narrative. So this was a 13 year old female who had facial injuries. Essentially, the, the crux of this story is the daughter was trying to get a cow into the barn, the cow hyper extended the gate and when the cow made it through the gate flung back hitting the daughter in the face. And then you can see that from um, the description here. Her injuries looks like she had potential facial injuries and in, in broken teeth, something like that. So you'll get the sense from this narrative, this redacted narrative, that you get a really wonderful sense of what happened, how it happened, and what happened afterward. And from that, the, the um, information in yellow is what the coders are able to go into and adapt into the OICS codes. Um, so we take notes about this, we're able to kind of really get the intentionality. We classify the farm and agricultural injury, injury classification as well. Um, so just to point out the rich detail we get from these ambulance reports. And then similarly, for a true forestry case, which in our region is, is unfortunately common, well, common shouldn't be the word, but it does happen. Um, another example of here where patient is a professional logger, was struck by a tree on the ground that he was limbing and it sprung and struck him directly in the left lower leg. And you can then see what types of um, injury he had. So obvious leg deformity, you know, midway between knee and ankle. So this again is really um, highlights exactly what happened and able to code in OICS. And then we also can see if there are two ambulances were dispatched, sometimes they have complementary information. So wanted to give those to you guys as an example. and. And again, the EMT is being on scene. I think seeing the information firsthand, you get such um, complex information and that background. And then by the time that someone gets to the hospital, it is less likely that it's going to be translated into an ICD-10 e-code as specifically as it is from the, from the ambulance reports. So just to wrap up here, I just want to make um, I think we're one more slide here. So I think you know, I've sort of explained a bit about the creative ways that we filled in the gaps. My colleagues around the country have certainly their own very creative ways in filling in the gaps for their region. We do have this sort of patchwork of surveillance activities that's helping inform ag health and safety. And what I really appreciate is that this community is very collaborative and we're working together more and more on sharing methods and our data and actually coming together with ideas of how we can push surveillance forward in the future for agriculture. And in order to do that, I think we're also looking toward how could um, you know, these collaborations be funded in a sustainable and cost efficient way, but to sort of push surveillance forward for the entire industry. So with that, I will say thank you so much for joining today and listening. And um, I'm certainly open to questions and please don't hesitate to contact me. All right, so I see Sarap had a question. Is your decision, um, does your decision take into account the number of keywords? So yes, we do also look at the number of keywords present in a certain record. And you can, I think we actually have that noted um, so if you look at the examples that we had here, we have actually for the coder to see, we can see right here the stems found. Snowball stemmer is one of, is the, a type of stemmer for machine learning. Um, we found barn, cow, and milk. And then for the, um, in terms of found for the uh, logger, tree, limb, 
in lager was found in this one as well. So we do um, count how many are found in a given record with the assumption that the more keywords found potentially, it goes both ways. Sometimes the more keywords found, the more likely it is to be a case. However, sometimes there are keywords that are so just perfect for agriculture and they're not used for other things that also anytime you see that it's pretty much a slam dunk and um, I'm trying to think if there's any examples of that but you can imagine things like words like calf could be a baby cow could be a part of your leg um, you know going back to that but then there's others like a three-point hitch probably not used in a lot of other terminology um, so it does does vary Excellent. Well, Sarap, I always love collaborating with you and hopefully we can, uh, yeah, get you guys started down, down in Florida, so. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Scott. Um, I just wanna uh, give everyone a couple more minutes. We still have about seven minutes or so. Um, so if there are any other questions, we'll hold off um, for just a couple moments um, to see if anyone has any other questions. So I see Janine mentioned pesticide cases are not often identified. And I think you're right. That is one, and that kind of falls into that category that I mentioned before about how occupational illness is incredible, much harder to capture because often there's two things that can happen there. You can have an acute pesticide exposure, which we do come across in our system. So if somebody has an acute exposure and we've seen where they were in spraying in the fields and they felt lightheaded or dizzy, those we capture. Any that are chronic and over time, as you're mentioning there, that somebody would go to their provider eventually and say, oh, I've been feeling really crappy. And you know, then they ask, well, what do you do for a living? If they do ask, let's hope. Um, you're absolutely right that that is more difficult. I know some states, and I think New York, our own, is one included that does have a pesticide poisoning registry that physicians are supposed to report to, but it's not a perfect science and it does not exist everywhere either. So um, you're welcome, Ricardo, and uh, thanks for joining. And then, Seraf, I see that you have um, suggestions for funding, funding, funding for similar research. Um, so, you know, I know there's some efforts, um, certainly at NIOSH, about funding for ag surveillance, or at least there's talk about how we can be working together. Um, I do know that there's efforts also um, through the Farm Bill and through USDA and the, through ASHCA, the Agricultural Safety and Health Council of America, um, to be pushing for better ag surveillance, potentially through funding through USDA. So. Yeah, it remains to be seen, but um, I think we're, we're talking to the right people and, and making a push for that as well. Um, and yeah, and Janine, I think they usually do not ask about occupation. Physicians historically, I think, have something like three hours, if that, of training in occupational medicine when they're in medical school. <laughs> so I think that's also a push that we've been trying to um, get folks understanding that work impacts your health. Um, the Northeast Center actually developed a clinician's um, reference manual that I can pass along after, but it's a website that they can go to see short videos of different occupational tasks in agriculture and learn more about if they have a, a patient that is a farm worker or a farmer, they can actually have that mental picture a bit better of what they're doing or what they may be exposed to. So um, that, that is something we've tried to work on, but it's a, it's a constant struggle for us um, in terms of educating folks that are not occupational medicine specialists to be paying attention to, to work-related injury and illness and chronic disease. 